Hi, everybody. <laughs> Trying to figure out if I'm on or not. These things really do happen in real life. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to everybody for joining us as we continue our month-long celebration of Black culture and history. And I am beyond excited to have the opportunity today to have a conversation with one of the leading poets of his generation, Kevin Young, who is also going to share some of his poetry with us. I'm equally excited to be joined in this conversation by Robin Cost Lewis, the outgoing poet laureate of Los Angeles, who received her PhD in creative writing and literature from USC, and who is currently a writer in residence here at Dornsife College. Robin's debut poetry collection, Voyage of the Sable Venus, won the National Book Award in poetry, making it the first time a poetry debut by an African-American artist had ever won that prize. Kevin is also an editor, an essayist, a curator. He's authored 11 books of poetry. In addition to many other books, he's also served as the poetry editor for The New Yorker. Just last month, Kevin stepped into the role of the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is an amazing treasure. And he follows that after spending five years as director of the, of the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And this past year, Kevin edited what has truly been called the most ambitious anthology of Black poetry ever published. It's called African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. Robin and Kevin, as it turns out, are just wonderfully close friends, and they were commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art in 2018 to write a series of poems reflecting on a series of drawings by Robert Rauschenberg in the 34 illustrations of Dante's Inferno. So it's just such a joy to have them here with us today. And I think we're going to start off by asking Kevin if he could begin with some poetry. Thank you so much, uh, President Folt. It's such a pleasure to be here and an honor to speak with you and to speak with Robin uh, and to talk about the anthology, which is a project that took a number of years and is dear to my heart. Uh, Robin, of course, has a large selection in the anthology. She's uh, among one of the stars, and so it's really great to read from it. I won't dare read her work, um, but I, I thought I'd read from Langston Hughes. This is a, his signature poem. You may know it, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and order older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Well, it's hard to follow that poem um, <laughs> with anything, but I thought I would read a poem of mine that I had written um, years ago now to Langston Hughes, who of course, among other things, invented uh, the form of blues poems in uh, poetry or the blues form in poetry. And um, so this is a blues I wrote. Um, it's honoring him and it plays with some of his facts. Like he was actually a bus boy at one point um, and it mentioned some of his uh, other titles. And it just so happens it was the first poem I ever published in the New Yorker years ago, uh, over 20 years ago now. And um, at the time, I wouldn't have ever thought I would be editing the book myself, um, uh, much less the uh, magazine every week. So um, it's, it's sort of full circle for me. Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes, they'll come now and sang them weary blues. Been tired here, 
feeling low down, real tired here since you quit town. Our ears no longer trumpets, our mouths no more bells, famous poet, busboy, do tell us of hell. Mr. Shakespeare and Harlem, Mr. Theme for English B, preach on, kind sir, of death, if it please. We got no more promise. We only got ain't. Let us in on how you came a saint. Langston, Langston, Langston Hughes, won't you send all heaven's news? So there's some Langston Hughes for you. Thank you. That's a wonderful start for this day. I think it's a, when you hear those beautiful spoken words, it's hard to not begin to feel some enormous feeling of joy and purpose. And I was going to start by asking you about influences. And clearly, you got us started on that. And, and I'll come back. I was going to start by asking Robin a little bit about her influences as a poet. And I know in part that, Kevin, you are one of her early influences. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Robin? Sure. Uh, when I started writing poetry seriously, or thinking that this might be something that would give my life profound meaning, poetry. Um, a friend gave me a bunch of Kevin's books. And at the time I was very, very ill and bedbound for a long, long time. And I just remember falling at Kevin's language and at what he could do with history, uh, with culture, with uh, what, what, is, what does it mean to put those two things together? That's not the way I was taught poetry. I was taught um, that poems a, didn't include my history and culture and didn't include most people's history or culture uh, of anyone around me. Like the poetry I was taught was Whitman and Dickinson and I love Whitman and Dickinson, so I'm not trying to put them down, but it felt like a friend of mine said to me recently, uh, a new young poet, he goes, I thought when I was starting to write poetry that all the poets were dead, <laughs> that there were no living poets. He said that they were all in the 19th century. Right. I didn't think that, but I definitely didn't know that the kind of aesthetic verve that Kevin was showing his work, I could also kind of celebrate my own history, uh, the history of the Great Migration West, um, philosophical inquiries that have always been very important to me. Also, I have a background in ancient languages. So just archaeology and the ancient world, I just didn't know. And Kevin's books, you know, sure, the poems were ex extraordinary, but also the craft, the aesthetic, what he was making English do just blew my mind. And I, I basically haven't looked back since. I can't believe I get to be his friend now, too. <laughs> You know, that's such a beautiful statement. And I bet for Kevin hearing someone that he also admires talk about that influence must mean everything. It's like when our students tell us that we had an influence, it's, it's like the best gift we can ever hear. For you, Kevin, you're involved so clearly in mentoring and, and inspiring, but shaping culture in so many different ways. Where do you draw some of your big inspirations? And, and do you remember when you first felt that active pull towards poetry, like we just heard uh, Robin talk about? I do. I mean, there were several, uh, you know, when I, I was in middle school, probably when I started writing seriously, which sounds strange, but, um, you know, I took a little class and it just inspired me in part because um, the teacher would, if you wrote something that was worth, uh, he thought worth something, he would have it typed up and mimeographed. Uh, and as I've said before, it smelled really good. The Mimeo machine. If you remember that, you know, <laughs> um, and the little purple uh, type. And he would hand it out and he would hand out, he hand out my first poem that I ever wrote uh, with my name not on it. It would be anonymous. And there was something amazing about that. I think uh, I realized later that if my name was on it, I think I wouldn't uh, have been as much drawn mm -hmm. to it because there was something about that secret thrill. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really when I went to uh, college um, that I discovered things that I probably already knew, but I, I were brought home to me. I went to Louisiana where both my family's from, both sides of my family are from, I should say. And um, 
you know, we just sat on the porch in the pouring rain for a week, uh, hoping to go to the Zydeco Festival down the street. Uh, the, the end of our lane, it turns out, uh, which is just like a dirt road. Um, and I went to college and I started writing and I started realizing that that was what poetry was, was the dirt. It was the mud, you know, it, that rain, the way people talked, the way we sat there and watched the world was worthy of poetry. And it was sort of a version of what Robin's saying. I hadn't seen my grandparents in poetry. Um, I hadn't seen that exactly. Uh, and I think sometimes you find your influences later after you've actually tried to attempt the thing. So it was later that I came in depth to Langston Hughes's poetry, which seeing, you know, that those muddy waters and New Orleans, uh, you know, uh, where I know Robin has family from and everything, you know, you start to see all the matrix of what you become. But it wasn't obviously available to me. And I had lived in Kansas uh, before then, before college, where Langston Hughes had lived in Topeka. Um, and so and it turns out there were lots of poets and musicians and Black folks uh, from Topeka, including Gwenla Brooks, who I did know in high school. I had known that she was born there. But it was only later that I really came to treasure those people and that connection. Um, but a lot of it came to being to understanding myself, but also understanding that that was a topic for poetry. Uh, and that that actually was the topic of poetry was mud and dirt, family, the way they spoke, and also the way they didn't say things, the things, the silences, which I think also drive us as poets. Do you feel, I, I, I'm really interested. I love, I mean, poetry is, oh, Robin, were you speaking? Yeah, I just wanted to say for the students and the audience why I want to put a frame around what this conversation is saying so they understand what it what it might mean a little bit more poignantly. I went through kindergartner to 12th grade with not one writer of color ever being on any in any book, any reading list, any requirement, nothing. I never ever saw a writer from any part of the world other than uh, white American writers. So that by the time I got to reading these novels, my parents gave me books on the side, but by the time I got to reading these novels and poems, it was such a profound revelation because of that. And I just think it's important for the students to know that. Well, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, that's another silence that you're writing against sometimes is, is, is uh, not having that experience. Um, I remember asking high school teachers of mine, you know, the, who was a great teacher in, in many respects, but like, should I read James Baldwin? You know, tell me what I should read. He said, you don't need to read, bother with him. <laughs> you know, like in the, the idea that then later at the Schomburg Center, I helped get his archive there. You know, it means so much more and means something different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lucille Clifton, who's uh, who helped pick my first book and who I hope I'll get to read a little bit of later, was someone I, who I came to. No teacher taught me her, as I recall. Uh, and I came to her work later and, um, you know, then to get her archive at Emory, uh, it all felt like full circle for me. And, you know, I think um, Robin is really good at uh, looking back and looking ahead. And I think that's what helps you look ahead and have the strength, uh, you know, thinking about culture and black culture and those continuities, which I hope the anthology shows. And I know the museum uh, that I had the honor of directing shows um, that continuity and context is, is everything. One of the things I think I've always felt about poetry is it's you read poetry, but then you can hear poetry. And that second, just listening to you, thinking about the reinforcing of who's reading the poetry and how you hear it. And I keep thinking a little bit right now about Amanda Gorman. I mean, at the presidential inauguration, I can only imagine the way millions of people in America felt at that moment. And, you know, Kevin, I've heard you quoted saying that there's hardly any part of American culture that you can point to that doesn't have Black influence. And we are having a profound moment, and it's in the words, it's in the faces, it's in the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests, it's Amanda Gorman, it's the narratives coming out from Black filmmakers and showrunners and influence you know, of incredible poets like the two of you. Let's talk a little bit about where it's going and how, how do we keep it going? How do we make sure, or, or just what do we do to support this and use this to change the underlying societal structures that need to go along uh, to see this renaissance? Yeah. 
I mean, I think one of the things, you know, and I, I'm happy you brought that up because I think it's absolutely true. We're in the midst of a renaissance and sometimes you need to just say that. Um, you know, that's a big part of helping us understand this is a special moment. Um, you know, having done this anthology of 250 years of, of Black poetry, uh, there have been other moments like this, but I don't think nothing quite like this and, and seeing it in, uh, or anything quite like this, nothing like this. Um, what I love <laughs> is that there isn't, you know, um, it's sort of this time that we need to mark um, and I think poetry has already been marking it. Poetry has been saying this for a while. Pay attention, look, you know, listen. Um, these are the important things. And there's a number of books, uh, uh, poems in the book that I think point to that, uh, Robin's among them, that think about the, you know, the way language uh, has been shaping us, the way violence has shaped us. Uh, poets have been turning to, for instance, writing about Emmett Till for, as long as, as soon as he was lynched in 1955. Um, and that power of attention, and you know, I have a poem, my poem that's in the anthology is a poem for him and a go, paying a pilgrimage to go see not where he was buried and not where he uh, uh, was lynched, but the story he was taken from to have that horrible experience, uh, that murder, his murder. Um, but it's also the aftermath of that, that I think includes the poems that are written in honor of him, that remind us that we're in a precedented time as well as an unprecedented one. Uh, and that poets are memorializing that as a way of talking about now often. Um, I know I was when I was writing my poem. And then as the director of the museum, I ha sometimes have to step back and remember just as a visitor, I went with my son, uh, who was then about 12, you know, uh, roughly Emmett Till's age, and we stood in line to see uh, the casket, which uh, we had the honor of having at the museum. And, you know, in many ways, we were in line, uh, much like those who were in Chicago, to see his body, which his mother, Mamie Till, bravely uh, insisted be shown to show the, the lynching. And Jet Magazine, whose archives are also um, affiliated with the at Smithsonian um, showed the the lynching, you know, the body, uh, haunting image. But I think what she knew and what I think poets know is you have to look sometimes. And witnessing is a big part of poetry. Uh, and witnessing isn't just seeing, but it's also saying. Um, and I, I think saying what you saw is what these poets are doing. It's, I think, a lot of what we need to do to maintain the Renaissance, as you said, to listen. Uh, I think it's first and foremost, but if you're seeing it, uh, you know, you need to say, and I, I think that feeling free to say it doesn't mean there's one way to say it. And in fact, I think the exciting thing about the Renaissance right now is the different ways people are saying it, different art forms, but also poets themselves feel very comfortable uh, doing as Robin does so beautifully, erasures. I sometimes write in blues forms. People write in any form they can to name this pain in order to move past it. And that's very much a blues impulse. You know, I think our students, and, and I've heard this so many times that art in all of its amazing forms is sometimes the only way that people can voice things that are so painful, but um, important to be said. And I'm very interested in your own experiences, teachers and mentors or in running the museum. Do you see that people that may have never said a word suddenly this incredible expression comes forward? Have, you know, share a little bit about how that's felt for both of you. I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things the museum has been testament to are the ways that people want to be connected and see themselves um, and see each other. Um, but I see that as the poetry editor of the New Yorker. You know, I see how people, as the pandemic started up and, and quarantine began, people started writing about it. Um, and I think that we're in a particular moment that is also shaped by Black poets, um, that Black poets are the, have created such a lane, let's call it, to, and an insistence that you have to be able to write about what's happening around us. Um, they've written about it so artfully and so well that I think a lot of other poets of many stripes are, are take uh, heart from that. Uh, and certainly the poets of color who have been filling our pages um, have been writing about lots of different things in lots of different ways that I think think about um, this reaction 
uh, this need to say, as I'm, I'm saying. Um, and I've been really struck by the artfulness and, you know, the diversity uh, of poetry writ large. I, you know, I, I encountered it firsthand editing the anthology, um, but also, I also see it sort of weekly and daily in The New Yorker and, and seeing how people are really trying to write about right now, um, which is also a way of talking about the future. And uh, poets can be, dare I say, prophetic at times. And sometimes we're running poems that we took well before uh, the, the pandemic, but that speak to it. Uh, Marilyn Nelson had an amazing poem called Hawk and Dove, uh, really about this, the, you know, violence and the threat of violence and uh, memory. And I mean, just everything, the things that are uh, at the heart of this stuff. Um, and she wrote it and I took it a year ago, you know, before all this, I think, you know, a year before even that. So it's just, it's important as a poet, I think, and I say this to the young people who are listening, uh, young people of any age who are starting out, you know, it's important to say what you're gonna, not just what you see, but also what you might dream and imagine. And um, some of that is, is looking ahead and, and seeing the future. Uh, and I'll let Robin take it from there. Mm -hmm. Love to hear about that from you. I love everything you just said, Kevin, and I co-sign and agree with you. I think in terms of uh, the classroom, that uh, a couple of things. One is I, I'm very committed to teaching undergraduates as regularly as possible. Um, that's really important to me because they feel the renaissance that we're talking about. And the student body of who registers for creating writing programs really changed over the last 20 years, especially the last two. Um, and USC, you know, our creative writing program is pretty extraordinary. I'm not trying to toot our horn, but I'm here because the colleagues that we have here are extraordinary writers in the world. And then the students that we attract are extraordinary students. And, you know, compared to when I first started writing first fiction and now poetry, the the demographic is just a thing of beauty. I mean, and not just I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about aesthetics, like the kinds of work that students bring into the class, why they're bringing that work into a class. They understand themselves already, thank God, to be witnesses of their own world. And they're trying to really use poetry uh, to both record, but also to make magic. Uh, and an offering to the world. And it's just really incredibly inspiring to be a teacher of poetry as much as a writer of poetry. Um, also to that end, you know, our creative writing PhD program is I think the best in the world, but it's one of very few. Um, and that's really something to have, that couldn't have ex existed 20 years ago, a PhD that's both critical and creative. That's extraordinary. There are poetry organizations like uh, Kev A. Conum, which I, of which I am a graduate fellow of uh, Black Poetry Foundation, Canto Mundo, which is a poetry foundation for Latino writers, Kudiman, which is a poetry fellow, uh, fellowship and foundation for Asian writers that are just starting, some really new powerful organizations for uh, ind indigenous and First Nation and Native American writers. It's an extraordinary time in poetry. And, you know, we talk about it, I've been talking about it a lot this year, especially with my agent, uh, who was saying, because I was I was in a moment of kind of like, oh my God, this year, and, and will they be books in the future? We were joking. And she said, you know, the thing that's so strange is that poetry books have been flying off the shelf this year. Oh. Because mm -hmm. people really, you know, understand that poetry is a mirror. Poetry is an experience of the time, you know. And when the chips are way, way down as COVID has put the chips down, you know, people have been picking up poetry because it mirrors the struggles of the self. It mirrors the grief of the self. A lot of people are grieving right now, you know, and it also mirrors the culture and the change that has taken place right now, which is why Amanda Gorman probably was the inaugural poet this year. And also, dare we say, it's important to always remember when Barack Obama uh, first uh, nominated, he chose Elizabeth Alexander, the great yeah. poet, to be his yeah. inaugural poet, yeah. right? It's no coincidence that these poets are holding hands in history and through time. Well, while I have two people who are poets and dear friends, I'm gonna ask a kind of silly question, but 
I think we want to know how do poets talk to each other? What do you talk about? Do you talk trade secrets? Do you, do you trade back beautiful words? I mean, what is it like poet and poet together? Sure. Tell you the truth or the... <laughs> I mean, I think that poets often, I think uh, the one thing I would say is that people often think poets only talk about poetry and usually they talk about everything but poetry. Yes, it's yes, usually it's gossipy and, and, and a little bit fun. And, and, you know, sometimes there's food involved, uh, at least in the before times and, and occasionally, very rarely a little bit of drink, you know. Well, I always thought it'd be way cool to be a poet. So I'm glad you do all those fun things. What about you, Robin? You've been working I mean, closely with a dear friend. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. Uh, now that we're getting older, we also talk about our children. <laughs> How are they doing? They're, uh, Kevin and yeah. Kevin's son and my son are very close in age. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, I think with Kevin and others, we geek out about form. I forget mm -hmm. Kevin and I did an event and I was trying to quickly suss out whether or not a Hughes poem was, what was the rhyme scheme? Was it an ABBA or an ABABA? And, you know, and I could say that in shorthand to him and he knew exactly what I was trying to see. Sure. Um, I don't I think, know. I think also we, passion about, you know, sure, what I love about a sure. poet who I admire is they have a passion for any of the things they touch. And, and you know, Robin can talk uh, beautifully about history. She can talk beautifully about her experience in archives, she can talk about her experience in the world. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, that's really important. Um, poets often are our memory bank uh, and, and they often have this connection to memory that's really important, uh, much less history. And the two unite in poetry in ways that I think bring history to life often. I sometimes say that I'm yes. really interested in the music of history and the history of music. And the way those two things interact uh, for yes. me is really important. Uh, That's beautiful. And it, they're ways of, of thinking about, uh, again, the past, but also the future. Yeah. The other thing I'd say, too, is uh, one of my favorite movies is a movie called Wings of Desire. Um, and I'm dating myself. But in the movie, the angel there there's a kind of cohort of, of fabulously dressed angels, <laughs> and they meet up in libraries in the evenings and describe to each other what they've noticed during the day, uh, uh, the actions of human beings. And I always tell my students to watch this movie because I feel like that poets are the angels in in that movie. If we were to have a character, we would be the angels. And so what I talk about when I see Kevin, if we haven't seen each other for a long time, is here are some of the things I've seen in the world that I found interesting and that haunt me, or here's some of the books that I've seen or some of the authors that I've seen, some of the art that I've seen that I think kind of nail humanity down or for a moment and I wanna share that with him. It's those kinds of things. You know, the beautiful thing on college campuses that didn't exist that many years ago are the, the incredible number of poet societies. And yeah. I have heard, and a lot of them are almost improv poetry. They, they, they can come in so many forms. And I just sometimes walk outside Bovard here on campus and there might be a group out that doing poetry readings of their own poetry. Yeah. Now that has got to give us all an immense feeling of hope and excitement, but you're inspiring them. You know, you, your work is probably what they're using and, and they're thinking about it. So before I ask Kevin to um, read some more poetry, could you each have something that you want to say to our students? You know, I'm sure a lot of them sometimes are wondering, you know, how do you get through this moment and, and things like that. And I just would love to hear what you might like to share with them. Sure. I'll go first because um, I'm teaching I've been teaching all day and yesterday. So, okay, students, here's what I tell my here's what I tell my students. Do you see this wall behind me? Do you see that wall? The back wall? I've been keeping, I've been an avid diarist since I was 14 and I'm 56 now. So there are hundreds of volumes. That's just a few of them. Uh, I think it's really important to spend time with yourself and to listen to yourself think. And a diary lets you do that without witness and without judgment. And I would suggest to all of you, if you don't keep a diary, I also keep a photography diary now where if I don't have time to write, I'll just go out and take pictures. Um, I just think it's very, very important to stay close to oneself and to hear what yourself is saying back to you. 
and, and you can do that with a diary. And um, you could also write poems in there that you never show, right? I have hundreds of poems. I'm finding poems from when I was 15. I never even thought I was a poet then, um, you know, that I didn't even know, but just trying. I think the self wants to sing. The self wants to lament. The self wants to grieve. And the page is a very safe place to do that. So I would just say, spend some time with yourself. And what I love about poetry, I was joking with some filmmaker friends of mine, is it's cheap. Poetry is cheap. This is what you need. That's it. <laughs> okay. My friends who are filmmakers are like, we have to raise $5 million to blah, blah, la la. Right? I'm like, you guys, this is all I need. Also, Toni Morrison, the great Nobel laureate, you wrote with number two pencils on a legal pad for most of her life. So, long hand every morning. Long hand every morning. Well, and that's the thing is sometimes I was just talking to another writer about this. Um, you know, Morrison wrote every morning. I think she woke up at 4.30 or 5 every morning and yes. wrote her novels that way before yes. the world was awake, before her kids were awake. Um, and she was a primary breadwinner. She was the person and she did it. So it's hard when you're sitting there, you know, tweeting, um, you know, with your feet up, like feeling like, what was me to really complain? Like in a certain way, you owe it to yourself to do, as Robin said, she, I mean, she put it so uh, well, I feel like I'm her student. The self <laughs> wants to sing. Um, that's such a beautiful way to put it. And then what I would say about that is you have to be very generous to that self. Um, Robin put it in a different way. I'm sort of echoing what she said, but uh, I find that especially if you're writing a first draft, you have to be incredibly open to it and just let it flow and not be critical. Uh, and what I call the demon editor needs to come in later, but kick that demon editor out at first. Um, let yourself say, and each of us, I think, would say to you, sometimes you have to say the thing you didn't know you thought. Um, writing is a process and it's one of discovery. And uh, it should be discovery for the reader, of course, but I think it also needs to be for the writer. Um, and, you know, I think this is true of us as individuals, whether you're a writer or not. Um, there's that act of discovery, that act of attention that leads to, you know, places you didn't know, things you didn't remember, um, uh, you know, things that you needed that you didn't know how to say. And mm -hmm. the more you do that, the better you get at saying that and trusting that place that art of improvisation that I think runs through all of Black culture and that I think for me has really sustained me in this past year. Um, you know, okay, well, we got this, that I only have these things in my fridge, I got to figure out how to eat, um, you know, and I could order or I could stay in or, you know, there's ways that you then just make these choices that are about what you have in front of you and what you can yes. make from that. Yes. Uh, that's how all the great foods I love came from, whether it's gumbo or, or whatnot. And so for me, um, that was always a place to, to begin and, and end is, is improvisation. And I hope that, you know, Langston Hughes is teaching us that, Brooks is teaching us that, and a few of the poems I'll, I'll end with, I hope, think about that too. Well, I think we could talk. I know I would love to sit and listen to you both for such uh, so much longer. It's just been absolutely beautiful to talk with you. We have a little bit of a surprise, Kevin. We actually have 25 copies of the poetry anthology that we are going to be giving out to students in attendance mm, and uh, one president in attendance as well. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna put a link to that entry form put into the chat so students go Go on there and and uh, sign up. We would love to give you this book. It's amazing. There it is. Thank you. I wanted to have it to show to everybody. I just think it's fantastic. You've got us all wanting to read and hear. And so as we close out, maybe Kevin, I'm, I'm going to ask you turn it back to you to close it out. But maybe as you do that, can you just tell us what gives you joy? And then I think you'll close by giving us joy with your readings of the poetry. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, Robin. Gosh, there's so much uh, these days, uh, even if in the midst of this uh, pandemic and the other pandemics, you know, with racism uh, around. Um, but for me, I really try to focus on the little things. Uh, it is things like returning to cooking. I've considered that a blessing during this time, uh, making food that sustained my family for generations. Uh, they were essentially farmers and raised their own food, you know, two generations ago, which isn't that long. And um, so having that 
background, it's been an excuse for me to, to return to that. Um, you know, I'm a lover of music and, uh, you know, you can get almost anything now, but uh, there's nothing like listening to the actual vinyl record that my dad played. I think I, I did a count recently. It was two million times. Um, the harder they come, you know, um, and hearing that crackling and he kept his records in great condition. So it's barely a crackle. It sounds perfect. Um, and so to me, there's those daily pleasures. And then there's the larger one of just, you know, friendship and relationships that also I think a lot of us have turned to in this time and, you know, maintained uh, and in some ways re resurrected and returned to. Uh, Zoom can, or, or whatever form we have can feel really distant, but at the same time, it's a way of connecting the, that you can show someone your uh, new apartment, in my case, since I recently moved or, or what have you. So uh, I think the smallest joys can bring, bring the biggest pleasures. Uh, and I hope people are, are doing that. Shall I read a little something? Yes, thank you. Um, speaking of little pleasures, I thought I would read um, a poem of mine since I've been talking about food, what else is new, um, which is an ode to greens. Uh, I started writing these odes to everyday things uh, and I was thinking of uh, collard greens, but you can make your own. And then I'll read some Lucille Clifton um, poems. Ode to Greens. You are never what you seem. Like barbecue, you tell me time doesn't matter, that all things wait. You take long as it takes. Wife, to worry, you can sit forever, stewing, grown angrier by the hour. Like ribs, you are better the day after when all is forgiven. Death's daughter, you are often cross, bitter as mustard, sweet when collared. Yet no one can make you lose all your cool. What strength you started with, mama's boy, medicine woman. You tell me things end far from where they begin that forgiven is not always forgotten. One day the waters will part. One day my heart will stop and still you'll be here, dark green as heaven. <laughs> Thank you. And then I'll read a, a few from the anthology, uh, a short. This is a poem by Lucille Clifton called Cutting Greens. Mm -hmm. Cutting greens, curling them around I hold their bodies in obscene embrace, thinking of everything but kinship. Collards and kale strain against each other away from my kiss-making hand and the iron bed pot. The pot is black, the cutting board is black, my hand. And just for a minute, the greens roll black under the knife and the kitchen twists dark on its spine and I taste in my natural appetite, the bond of live things everywhere. Since I mentioned Marilyn Nelson, I thought I'd read her poem. Uh, this is a poem that I think uh, I first saw on the subway in New York. Uh, you know, they have poems often. And so uh, it was really a treat to see it there. And then I'll end with a Lucille Clifton poem. This is Marilyn Nelson, a strange, beautiful woman. A strange, beautiful woman met me in the mirror the other night. Hey, I said, what's you doing here? She asked me the same thing. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> isn't the, isn't yeah. she right? <laughs> oh, she's so good. What I love about her is that she's, um, you know, she also, uh, her father was a Tuskegee Airman. She writes about that beautifully. A terrific poet, writes YA poems. Uh, if you're looking for a poet to, uh, to discover and uncover, please uh, turn to Marilyn Nelson. And I did a podcast with her last summer. All right, I'm gonna um, end uh, with this poem by Lucille Clifton which is called, usually referred to by its first lines, uh, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, 
born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight, my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I want to just let there be silence for a few minutes for that incredibly beautiful poetry. And Robin, it, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, we're so uh, fortunate to have you and be part of our Trojan family and teaching and, and all the things that you're doing. And Kevin, it has just been fabulous to have you here. And you're helping us celebrate this moment, this moment on the planet, this moment in society, this celebration of Black culture and history. Um, I think this is a, a moment I'm going to always mark as a great start to the next day. And it's just been absolutely wonderful to have you. We are so grateful. Thank you very much. I speak for all of us when we say thank you and stay well. Be safe. Stay safe, thank everyone. You. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks.